Hello, everyone, and welcome to, I guess it will be a fairly short episode of Handmade Hero, because, well, uh, since we've been on RSI break with the hand, uh, I've just been basically starting the stream, and I take questions until we get up to a question that seems like it's one that should be recorded for posterity, and then I start recording. Uh, and now we've gotten one, but it, I think we chatted for like 45 minutes on relatively off-topic stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, here we go. First question of the day that's tech-oriented. Let's go ahead and, and, and check it out. Uh, so the question was, can you explain cross-compiling? Uh, and the answer is, yes, I can. And here I will. All right, so what is cross-compiling? First of all, for those of you who don't know what it is, because some people have maybe never encountered it. Uh, hopefully everyone knows what compiling is because we've talked about it a bunch. If you don't know what it is, go all the way back to the very first stream and I explain what it is. Um, the intro to C stream, for example, uh, will tell you exactly what it is. Uh, but as you know, um, compiling is the process by which we take source code and turn it into machine code, something that takes the text files uh, that we write that are the sort of human readable version of what we want the computer to do and turn it into actually something that CPU actually reads. Now, the textbook definition of compiling is a little bit different. I think technically, and I could be wrong about this, but technically the definition of compiling usually means something more like translating something from one language to another. So I don't really know what the textbook definition of compiling is, and I'm not trying to say that this is what the textbook definition is. What I'm trying to say is what we think of it as uh, when we do it here on Handmade Here, when we run the compiler. What we are trying to do is take uh, these text files that we have created that are source code uh, that we can read and turn them into something that the CPU reads. And we've looked uh, several times on the stream at what uh, x64 code, right? That's the, the sort of uh, encoding that the processor uses that we're trying to run on, right? Uh, and so what we're talking about very specifically when we talk about compiling Handmade Hero is we're talking about taking a source uh, file, a set of source files, right? You know, like handmade.cpp uh, and everything else, like all the source files, whatever they are, and turning them into some stream of binary, right? Uh, which the CPU can execute. Right? The CPU can understand this. So this is the human readable thing. This is the CPU readable thing. And the compiling step, this is compilation, right? Compilation turns the human readable stuff into the machine readable stuff for us. And that's fundamentally all we're doing when we're programming, right? Is we're trying to create, we're trying to create this, uh, but typing out a bunch of ones and zeros would be murderously hard on us, right? So we create textual things that are easier for humans to manipulate um, because that's way, way more efficient. Uh, you know, the, the very first programmers were actually inputting this stuff directly, right? The very first programmers programmed machines by actually putting in the actual instruction encoding in binary, you know, using flip like levers and stuff, right? Um, or punch cards later on. Uh, but quickly, you know, we kind of said that we can make this better by making something that translates uh, easier directives, things that humans can manipulate more easily. Uh, and that's where the concept of compilation kind of became central to the programming process where it's like, oh, instead of inputting this stuff directly, we should input it in some other language that's designed for easy human use uh, that can still output what we wanted to output. Uh, and, and that's, you know, where, where that comes from. So that's what we're doing when we compile. And the important thing to remember about compiling is really there's a couple different stages to this process. We kind of talked about it where technically, you know, when we say compile, well, really there's multiple steps to that. Uh, we compile, right? Uh, but then we, you also, if you remember, we link. There's a linker, right? Uh, so really like the, when we say, oh, we recompiled the program, well, usually when I say that, really what we're talking about is we recompiled and we relinked the program. Uh, because technically, usually, it's you compile, then you link, and then you have this thing, right? So it's it's really uh, worth noting that there's two steps here. Now, now, what are those two steps? Uh, you know, if you don't quite recall from way back in the beginning, uh, well, this first step where we do the compilation, that's turning our source code into uh, sort of a partially. Uh, it, it's turning it into partially this, right? Uh, and why is it partially this? Well, it's partially this because there's still some unknowns in the process. Uh, there's still some things that aren't quite known yet at the time when the compiler runs. Okay, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is because oftentimes more than one file um, 
is, uh, is involved in building the project. Uh, and especially if you don't use, like we use a Unity build, uh, what people call it on, um, on the stream, which has nothing to do with the game engine Unity. Uh, it's just saying that we build everything as one big giant source file. It's kind of a nice way to do things. When you do things that way, it may be a little bit less clear that this is happening. But in, a, in most people's projects, they don't actually do things that way. Most people's projects, there's a, the concept of an OBJ file that they actually overtly use. Uh, and what that means is, you know, you've got, you know, A.CPP and B.CPP and C.CPP, you know, I don't know, I'm making up names here, but you've got tons and tons of CPP files. You know, there may be like a thousand of these files, right? All involved in the project. And the compiler, you typically invoke on only just one of them. And you say compile a.cpp into oftentimes a.obj or a.o, depending on the operating system. This is the Unix way, right? This is the, the Windows way, right? And so when you compile something, you turn it into this object file. And then the object files, they all go into the linker, right? Uh, and the linker produces a single executable file, right? So it typically looks something more uh, like CPPs, you know, there's tons of them, maybe there's a thousand of them, who knows how many, a hundred of them, I'm not sure, right? They all come over to OBJs one-to-one, -one, right? So every individual CPP file becomes an OBJ file, okay? And then all of those files, the linker, um, this is linking, this is compiling. Uh, so compile, we link, and then we get an executable, right? or an ADAT out file or whatever, an ELF binary, whatever, whatever you're trying to produce, the thing that the operating system actually runs, right? So that's actually what's happening, right? When we talk about compiling, when we talk about doing compilation, uh, that's really what we're talking about, is that process. And this we know what it is, we look at this every day, this we don't really know what it is in the sense that we haven't really talked about too much on Handmade Hero, but what this is, is it's a partially CPU readable thing. Meaning inside it is actually machine code, right? So it's got machine code that's like ready. You could send it to an x64 and the x64 would know what to do with it. But it's not quite all there yet because since there's a lot of OBJ files, uh, remember those OBJ files call each other, right? Every CPP file that you make maybe calls something that's in some other CPP file or whatever. So if you have a function, right, let's say you have some function foo of x or whatever that you're trying to call, and foo of x is defined in one CPP file. Let's say it's defined here. Here's the definition, right? And then somewhere else is a call to foo, right, in some other CPP. Well, obviously, when I build these things, you know, when I produce the OBJ files, those OBJ files, they don't actually have enough information. Neither of them has all the information they need to successfully have foo get called because the, de the actual code for foo is in one place and the actual call to foo is in another place and those two things aren't even seen by the compiler at any given time. The compiler is working at one file at a time, right? Uh, and so that's where the linking phase comes in. So the machine code that's in the OBJ files has what are called like unresolved symbols basically in them, right? It has things in them that it doesn't really know what it is yet. So let's take that call to foo. We're trying to call foo, right? Uh, so maybe there's something like a jump instruction or a call instruction, right? Uh, for the, in the case of a function call, it'd be a call instruction, right? So it's got the machine code, the actual binary encoding for a call instruction, and then it needs to know the address it's trying to call. It needs to know what it's trying to call into. But it doesn't know what this is. It has no idea because it doesn't know where foo actually is. It's never even seen foo. It doesn't know anything about it other than maybe its function prototype, right? So that remains as sort of an ambiguous symbol. And then it gets fed into the linker and the linker reads these OBJ files and has the OBJ files have information that tell the linker where all those symbols are and what they are. So then what the linker does is the linker does a couple things. It merges all of these things together, right? So it, it's basically something that allows it to uh, create, for lack of a better term, um, a single homogenous thing with all the code that correctly can jump into itself and knows where everything is, right? So it's that. Um, but it actually has a little more. So it's, it's gonna bind all these object files together, but it's gonna put in a, a few other things, okay? And so what's it gonna put in? Uh, well, what it's gonna put in is on uh, this executable, right? We have the result of all of the OBJ files. So all the OBJ files, 
uh, are are sort of merged into some a giant block of executable code. Uh, let's let's actually call this machine code. So all of this machine code, all of these OBJs are combined together. They're you know correctly aligned and all that stuff to produce machine code. All that machine code is all ready to go. It could start being run, right? But typically, because this is running in the context of an operating system, there is a bunch of like header data here as well, right? So the linker is not just producing a bunch of stuff for the CPU. It's also producing a bunch of data that typically goes at the beginning, but it could go anywhere. Um, it's producing a bunch of other information, right? That tells the operating system how to load and execute this code. Because remember, remember we talked about dynamic link libraries, right? Uh, dynamic linking. This concept that, well, you know, I have to call Windows for stuff. But Windows is already running when I run. We weren't compiled together. I didn't compile my app into Windows, right? That didn't happen. Uh, and so if you think about it, what happens there is at, at actual runtime, when this executable is loaded in and executed by Windows, it needs to know how to like patch up some things in my executable so that when I do jumps into Windows code, it knows where the Windows code is, right? So all of that information ends up having to be packed into this header, as well as some things that usually they stick on there that's like, uh, for example, in Windows, there's some stuff that identifies it as a Windows executable. So that there's like a thing, like a magic value and stuff like that in there, right? And it's even more complicated. There's lots more stuff in here, right? So it's, it's a very structured file. It has a lot of information. So and the linker does more than just mush the objects together. It also does a bunch of extra work to basically produce a file that's in the right format for the operating system to get the stuff out of, do what it needs to do, and start the program running. OK. So what is cross-compiling? Well, cross-compiling is when you want to run uh, this process, the exact one we talked about, compilation, linking, producing an executable. You want to run this process, but you want to run it for an operating system other than the one you are running on. So for example, let's say I have a Linux machine, oops, and I want to run uh, code on the Linux machine. So my goal is to run an executable on a Linux machine. Uh, but uh, I am running on Win32. This machine we're running on right now is Win32 machine. Well, it's a Win64 machine, right? But it's Windows, OK? Uh, so if I was to set up a tool chain that built a Linux executable on Windows, so I'm running the linker, the compiler and the linker on Windows, but I'm producing an executable that's in the format that a Linux machine would expect, that is cross-compiling. That's what cross-compiling is. It's simply the act of taking one operating system and one tool chain on that operating system, running it, and getting output that you can then run on some other operating system. OK? Very, very simple. So how does that work, was the question. Uh, and I had to go through this whole explanation so that you could understand the answer was incredibly simple, which is it's, there's literally nothing to it. All of this process, none of it has anything to do with the operating system at all, right? Nothing in this process has anything to do with the operating system. It's all just reading and writing files, right? So if you want to build a cross compiler, all you have to do is build a compiler and a linker exactly as you would if you weren't cross compiling, right? and then run it on some other operating system. There's no magic to it, right? Because all the compiler does is read in a CPP file, do a bunch of work on it, and then output the OBJ file. At no time does it have to interface with the operating system for anything other than loading and saving files, right? Which we all know how to do on any operating system, really. And you can even use a C runtime library for that, right? So all of that logic, all of the code for the compilation, does not depend on the operating system in any way. So if you wrote something that compiles for, say, x64, you could go run it on a PowerPC. You could compile that code with a PowerPC compiler, run it on a PowerPC, and it would still output x64 code because the compiler is a thing that has nothing to do with the platform it's running on. It's just code that generates file data, right? It's just generating data that it writes out to a file. So it doesn't matter 
what platform it's running on. Just because you run something, uh, code that generates x64 code, running it on a PowerPC doesn't make it suddenly output PowerPC code, right? Because, you know, I'm talking about literally the process of doing it is like, hey, I want to, uh, ex uh, uh, I, I want, uh, to output a call instruction here, right? That's what I want my compiler to do. My compiler did a bunch of work. It wants to write out a call instruction into the OBJ file or whatever, right? It just knows that, oh, a call instruction, I don't even remember what it is, but I know it's like OX5B or something, and then the address is encoded here or whatever, right? It just literally writes those bytes out to the file. So it doesn't need to be running on an X64 for any reason in order to write out X64 code right? Because the x64 code is just data, it's just bytes on the disk. So as long as the compiler knows what all of the opcodes are, it can write them out no matter what the host machine is, right? So you write the compiler just as you would if it was native, if it was on the same machine, if it wasn't cross-compiling, you'd write the same code, then you write the same exact linker, you would, you know, you write the same code uh, to link to XE, and just because you're not running on Windows or not running on Linux doesn't matter. It's the format that you output. The format of the file you output is the thing that determines what uh, platforms will be able to run it. So if I write a linker that writes an exe, it doesn't matter if I compile that linker on Linux, it's still gonna write out an exe that Windows would read. That's just how that works, right? Uh, so cross compiling, there's no magic to it. All it means is that the code for the compiler and the linker were programmed to output specific format things that were for a target other than the one that uh, they are running on. That's it. Uh, and so, uh, if you write your code well, like for example, LLVM, you know, it's a nice uh, 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 compiler or whatever, uh, you can just pick the target because it's got a bunch of backends in it, uh, one that generates x64 code, one that generates ARM code. And it doesn't matter whether you're running it on an ARM processor or an x64 processor. Whatever you compiled LLVM for has nothing to do with that code path. Both of those code paths will exist inside the actual compiled compiler, right? And so at that point, if it just have a command line switch that says, please generate ARM code, that just means that the compiler will now call its ARM code generator, which is a piece of code that knows how to write out files with, X, uh, with, with ARM uh, assembly uh, instructions in them, right? ARM machine code. Whereas if you tell it to run the x64 branch, it's just gonna call some code uh, that writes out uh, x64 machine code, okay? And that's it. So cross compilation is nothing special. It's no different than compilation. In fact, compilation is just compilation. The only thing that makes something cross compilation is if you happen to have compiled a compiler for some other operating systems format on you know, a different operating system. That's all that makes it cross-compiling, but the code for the compiler is identical. It doesn't change at all, right? Uh, because when you write a compiler that outputs x64 code, it will always output x64 code. And if you compile that compiler on PowerPC and then run it on PowerPC, it will suddenly output x64 code on the PowerPC. And so you've made a cross-compiler at that point just by recompiling the compiler on a different platform. Right? Compile an x64 compiler on x64 and you will have a compiler, compile an x64 compiler on PowerPC and you have a cross compiler. That's it. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, let's see. Let's see, I think we're just about out of time. Like I said, it was gonna be a very short one because we most of the time was off topic questions today. Uh, let's find out. Looks like there's no other super critical questions here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and wind down. There is cross compiling in a nutshell. 
Uh, oh, well, okay, here's one that's kind of on the topic. Uh, just so we do it. It's a cuber Caleb. He didn't put a Q colon in front of it, but I noticed it here. He just wanted to know, so why do I still need uh, Linux to compile for Linux? Uh, and the answer is you probably actually don't. Uh, but here are the reasons in practice why you oftentimes have to be on a particular platform uh, to compile for that platform. Reason number one is some important tool in this, some, some piece of this chain is not available for the platform you're talking about. So for example, right, I don't think, I don't know if on Linux there is a Windows linker. Like LLVM doesn't have a Windows linker, a thing that, it doesn't have a thing that can link to an exe. So LLVM on Linux can very easily output OBJ code that could be used for a Windows program, but on Linux you may not have access to a Windows linker, right? Now, I assume by now someone probably has run a right of Windows. Like Ming, Ming GW, Ming Win or whatever has one, so I assume you can do it on Linux, right? Uh, so I assume that that's actually the case. I don't really know, though, so I have no idea. But point being, one reason that you might not be able to do something is because the linker has never been ported. So you might have access to the compiler, but not the linker, or I guess the other way around, you may have access to the linker, not the compiler. But so in practice, you may not have all the tools that you actually need on, any, on one platform. So that's one thing that can happen. The next thing that can happen is uh, nobody may have done the work of setting up all the dependencies. So for example, uh, you know, in order to compile a program, oftentimes you need all of these system header files, all these .h files, system header files, system library files, right? If you don't have all those, you need all of those in order for the compiler and the linker to grab them when they're required. And so in order to build for Linux, uh, say on Windows, you need to grab all those files and you need to put them all on Windows and so that your Windows toolchain can access them, right? Uh, and so again, cross-compiling conceptually is incredibly simple. Hopefully it's, you know, I convinced you of that. But uh, as, you know, and builds can get incredibly confusing, right? Uh, as with many unnecessarily complicated build processes, building for an OS oftentimes is way more complicated than it needs to be because there's all these libraries you have to link with, there's all this special stuff that has to happen for producing the executable, or there's all these system header files, like hundreds of system header files, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you have to reproduce that whole environment because otherwise, you know, the compiler, it sees pound include, uh, you know, um, some, some Linux header file and Windows, you know, that's not on your machine. So you do have to do a bunch of work to set up a cross-compiling environment oftentimes that has nothing to do with having an actual compiler that can produce the code. Sometimes that's the easy part and the hard part is all the accoutrement, right? All the like, you know, other files that have to get input into the process so that the compiler, when you say pound include this, there actually is that that thing, right? Um, but that said, I would be surprised if you can't compile for Linux on Windows. I suspect you can. Are you sure there's not a tool chain for that? I feel like, um, I feel like that would surprise me. It's probably super janky, but I feel like it probably exists. Uh, anyway, all right. So uh, let's go ahead and close things down. All right. I don't want to sign into Google accounts, but thank you. Um, all right. Thanks everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, like I said, we're on RSI break right now. I don't have a specific ETA for when we'll be actually doing game coding again. Uh, but if you uh, would like to join us for more Q&A style chats, uh, obviously we're still here, uh, 5.30 p.m. tomorrow, I think. Uh, check the tweet bot though. I may have to move it up to six. I can't quite remember what exactly the schedule will end up having to be for tomorrow. There might be a reason why it has to be moved slightly, but uh, we'll be back here chatting. And then next week, I will also post uh, the tweet bot schedule uh, for next week. So if you've got questions, tech questions that you want uh, answered, I can uh, I can field them. Or if you just want to chat, like I said, we we do a pre-stream. Uh, I basically take off-topic questions till the first on-topic question, and then I start the recorded stream. So. Uh, if you have off-topic questions, we cover those too. Uh, that's about it for now. I'll hopefully see you all tomorrow uh, back here on Twitch. Until then, have fun programming. I'll see you guys on the internet.